Come, child of Bethlehem, make your presence known to us and dwell in the midst as we worship. Come, servant king, teach us the ways of your kingdom and make our hearts your throne. Come, brother of us all, show us the meaning of our humanity. Go before us and lead us to God. Bring us to the fullness of your kingdom. Amen. to the words of the gospel given to us in Luke chapter 19 verses 29 through 40. When he had come near Bethany and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, So those who were sent departed and found it as had been told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones shout out. Good morning. It is an honor to be here with you this morning. Let me set the stage. 
Phones were ringing. People around me were speaking urgently in Spanish, English, German, and Czech. And I was staring at a piece of paper with four other people trying, trying to think through step by step what all 14 of us would be doing Friday at 12 noon in downtown Chicago, Illinois. We were five or six days into intensive training with Christian peacemaker teams, an organization dedicated to building partnerships which transform violence and oppression. And us trainees had been tasked with organizing a demonstration, a protest, a public witness, if you will, in resistance to the Israeli military's 50-year occupation of Palestine. I'd been a part of public witnesses before. When I was a teenager, my youth pastor at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, Janet Ober, now Janet Ober Lambert, took a number of our youth group to an annual public witness against the Schools of America in Georgia. I'm pretty sure that was my first public witness ever. And together, we held white crosses and marched in a giant circle as the names of victims killed by the graduates of that school were read aloud. More recently, I marched with local organizers in Dayton, Ohio, resisting the travel ban on certain Islamic countries. In freezing weather, we marched to voice our allegiance to the marginalized and our dissatisfaction with our government's unjust decisions. I also stood next to women and men in pink hats when the women marched on Washington earlier this year. So I thought I knew about public witness. However, Christian peacemaker teams taught me that I had not a clue what goes into organizing a public witness. And then they taught me how to do it in four days. Those four days felt like the week before finals you know, marathoning in the library, pushing out paper after paper, freaking out about this Greek word or that theologian's understanding of revelation, trying to make sense of Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity, all the while maintaining a marriage, a job, and kids if you had them. Cheapers, what a rush. What a stressful, terrifying, exhausting rush. So while rushing about at training, I learned that a public witness needs at least three things, at least. A heartfelt message, a meaningful location, and people, people to get that work done. Approaching Jerusalem just before Passover, days before he would be killed, Jesus and his disciples had all those things. First off, they had a heartfelt message. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. As best I can tell, this message is a merging of words from Psalm 118, a psalm I believe was typically sung at the time of Passover, and the chorus that that multitude of angels sang on the hillside the night Jesus was born. A message of blessing, a message of peace, a message of glory in the highest heaven, a message that declares Jesus to be the king, the king that comes in the name of the Lord. I don't have to tell you all this, you wonderful scholars of Bible and history and things, but in a world where Caesar was king, in a world where Caesar is God, this message is subversive, it's edgy, it's risky, especially when marching up to Roman-occupied Jerusalem on the eve of a Jewish holiday, Passover, which celebrates God liberating the oppressed Jews from their oppressor. The atmosphere in Jerusalem at that time of year was super politically charged. The Jews were reminded what liberation felt like. The Roman guards were jumpy because they knew the narrative too. And revolution drifted through the air, 
alongside that smell of unleavened bread. This message was so risky that I'm convinced a few of the disciples gathered around Jesus were looking over their shoulder as they laid their cloaks on the road, wondering when they were going to catch the attention of the Roman guard and what they would do when they caught up to them. So they had a heartfelt message. They also had a meaningful location. Jesus and his disciples marched from the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley and up to the gates of Jerusalem. Now, the Mount of Olives served as the watchtower for Jerusalem. Every approach to the city could be seen from the top of that mount. And everything that happened on the mount facing the city was in clear view of the temple. Jesus and his disciples were super visible, and they meant to be. As they shout their heartfelt message and lay their cloaks on the road and march steadily on to Jerusalem, the Roman guards see them. The locals see them. The chief priests and the scribes see them. They were there, shouting this risky, subversive message at the top of their lungs, in full view of the temple and Rome. Their witness could not have been more public. Third, they had people. When they marched on Jerusalem, it wasn't just Jesus and his closest circle of 12. Luke 19.37 reads that as they were approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. The whole multitude. This phrase once again takes me back to the hillside uh, with the shepherds the night Jesus was born. It almost feels like the closing of one giant pericope, the multitude of angels on the hillside in uh, in Bethlehem, to the multitude of disciples on the hillside on the Mount of Olives, both proclaiming peace and glory in the highest heaven, marking both Jesus' entry into this world and his soon coming exit. This was a big moment in Jesus' ministry. This was a big moment for Jesus' followers. And it made some of Jesus' friends nervous. Pharisees get a bad rap in the Bible. Thanks to the perspective of the writers, we often treat the Pharisees like they're the bad guys. They are the ones always challenging Jesus, always trying to trap him, trying to kill him, conspiring against him. However, in the Gospel of Luke, The Pharisees are almost friends of Jesus. He eats at their homes. He talks to them in the temples, and they challenge each other, but it's mostly friendly. They warn him not to go to Jerusalem, perhaps because they're afraid for his life. You could probably argue other reasons there, too, if you wanted. And given that the fact that the Pharisees confront Jesus about the shouting before he even gets to the gates of Jerusalem tells me that perhaps a few of those Pharisees may even have been a part of the multitude, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Maybe. I don't know for sure. But as they get closer to the gates, assuming the Pharisees are in the crowd, the clearer the reality of those words set in. Perhaps the Pharisees continue to fear for Jesus' life. Perhaps they fear for their own. After all, they know what happens to people who challenge Caesar's divinity and authority. Imprisonment, torture, death. Teacher, they say, perhaps even respectfully. Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Please be quiet. The Romans can hear you. They will hear you. And Jesus responds, I imagine at a volume louder than makes the Pharisees comfortable. I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And after that, the Pharisees disappear from the rest of the gospel. And Jesus goes on to turn over the tables in the temple and teach the gospel of love to those who will listen. And as we all know, the story doesn't end there, right? Jesus is betrayed by his religious community. 
He is abandoned by some of his disciples. I say some because remember, the women stick with him, and their disciples do. He is killed, and then he rises again, conquering all that would have seen his permanent end. It's a good story. But I want to linger on the hillside of the Mount of Olives just for a second longer. While the Phar- with the Pharisees who order Jesus to tell his people to be quiet. Because this command to silence is present with us today. It is present in our churches, our institutions, and our denominations. It is a command we speak to each other. As followers of Jesus, we've been given a subversive and risky message. One that declares Jesus to be our leader, Jesus to be our brother, Jesus to be our savior. Jesus, who loved and celebrated the marginalized. Jesus, who treated tax collectors, women, lepers, children, and Pharisees, even Pharisees, with the same dignity and respect. Jesus, who washed the feet of even his betrayer. Jesus, who summed up the whole law to say, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We've been given this message. We've been given this Jesus to shout out like the disciples on the Mount of Olives in resistance to all that wants to wield power over us. To government, to social expectation, to oppressions, and even militaries. We've been given this message to shout out even in the face of divided denominations where private beliefs are stifled by public expectations of silence. Where private beliefs are held in place by the threat of losing a job, the threat of lost denominational unity, the threat of a changing reputation, the threat of losing funding. We have been looking at each other saying, please, just be quiet. They will hear you, whoever they are, and then they will know what you think, and then we're all done for. When Jesus and his disciples marched on Jerusalem, they had a heartfelt message, a meaningful location, and allies, people, to help get the work done. What is your heartfelt message? Is there a meaningful time and place to express that message? And who are the people who will back you up when it comes time to speak? Back in Chicago, the day of our public witness arrived. We gathered together in prayer. We held hands and focused on our goal. We knew the risks. We knew what we needed to say. We knew what we were about to do. The prayer ended, we gathered our courage and our supplies, and we marched to downtown. Perhaps joining the multitude of disciples who sang, blessed are those who come in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Amen. Let us confess our sins to both God and to the assembly gathered here today. Together. If we claim to have no sin, we deceive ourselves and are an example of a hypocrite to others. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and each other. We confess we do not always do your will that personal choices we make are not always to your glory. Help us, Lord, to be your willing servants to this troubled world. 
please speak aloud or silently in your heart any petition or confession you have to offer. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even as we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power and through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray. Ever gracious God, ruler of the universe, we give you thanks for our common mission as servants for the work of your church. We give you thanks for women and men whom you call to be leaders in your church. We are also thankful for teachers who form us for word and service through the witness and commission and mission 
of our seminaries. May the church truly reflect your compassion, mercy, justice, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I draw your attention to the piece called Intercession in Your Bulletin. Now we're going to, this is a little bit different for you, and I wanted to make sure we're clear on this. We're going to do this first, this A and B part is continuous in the congregation. We're going to hum the first line and sing the second line. And I will have each of the ten petitions. You're going to hum while I do the petition, and we'll sing together, the God of mercy, hear us in love, hold us in love. And she, Jen's going to, Jennifer's going to play it twice for us. We're going to do it twice together to begin. God of mercy, hold us in love, in peace, in peace. Of mercy, hold us in love. For peace and salvation, we pray to you. God of mercy, hold us in love. For peace and we need to do that faster. I'm sorry, Jen. <laughs> for for peace. For God of mercy, hold us in love. In peace, in peace, we pray to you. God of mercy, hold us in love. For peace and salvation, we pray to you. God of mercy, hold us in love. For peace between nations, for peace between peoples. God of mercy, hold us in love. For all our heart gathered of worship, we praise you. God of mercy, hold us in love. For all of your servants who live out your gospel, God of mercy, hold us in love. For those who govern that justice might guide them, God of mercy, hold us in love. For those who labor in service to others, God of mercy, hold us in love. Grant weather that nourishes all of creation. God of mercy, hold us in love. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. God of mercy, hold us in love. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy. God of mercy, hold us in love. Help us, comfort us all of our days. Keep us, hold us, pray, just love. I commission you to live a life that leads, leaves a mark, marking your community with prayer service, and generosity. I pray that the God of hope will give you the eyes to see the brokenness around you and the tools to become an agent of change. I commission you to become a beacon of hope for those whose lives have been devastated by violence, suffering, and loss. I pray that the God of healing will use your sacrifice to restore his kingdom. I commission you to be a bridge bridging the gap between race, gender, age, and religion. I pray that the God of all creation will give you the knowledge 
and understanding to become a peace person of reconciliation, binding the wounds of hatred and greed. I call you to joy in the midst of suffering. I call you to hope in the face of brutality. I call you to faith in the valley of death. I call you to love in the name of Jesus.